Well, welcome to another edition to a Valley to Vietnam. Uh, I'm Bob Tribe, your host, and with us today is Dr. Ron Rushford. Ron, welcome. Thank you, Bob. It's great to have you here. And Ron served in Vietnam uh, in 1968-69, and he's got a really great story. So, first of all, you were born in San Francisco. Correct. And um, you lived there just for a short time, though. You lived near, I, I think you said, the Palace of Fine Arts? Yes, it was a basement apartment, and the reason for leaving is because I had something like a dozen ear infections that first winter. Uh -huh. And after my ear was drained of infection several times, my parents says, we got to get out of the city. Uh, and they moved to Sacramento. And soon after that, your folks separated? Yes. So you're living with your mother, and um, you're eventually going to start school here. And if I remember right, you said you went to Bret Hart School. Bret Hart. Which is in Curtis Park. And you live downtown somewhere. I lived uh, with a in, a, in a home where they apparently rented out a room oh. for people and uh, was roomed with the oldest son. And I was just a first, second grader. And then I could walk to school from there. Uh -huh. And I was there for maybe two years or three before my mother was transferred to Los Angeles and I moved down south with her. So you were, I guess, eight years old when you moved to LA? Approximately, yes. Yeah. And you said you moved to a particular neighborhood, Boyle Heights. Uh, Boyle Heights, which is very close to the County Hospital in Los Angeles, and I guess not too far from USC, uh, but it was a heavily uh, Latinized community, and I was an outsider. Right. So I received several very notes, notes that said, you won't be here very long if he stays. And uh, because of that, my mother immediately found a place in the city called Page Military Academy that was for boys only, and I was transferred there uh, to be in a different environment. So you were there several years? I was there until the uh, 10th grade. Okay, so like seven, eight years? Correct. And tell us a little bit about Page, what, what it was like. Well, Page was a military school that was started back in 1908, and uh, it had a pretty remarkable history when Los Angeles was very young. In fact, they owned land all the way to the hills. It was Cochrane and San Vincente, which wasn't far from the um, Carnation Creamery, which was one of the largest buildings at the time. And uh, they had land all the way to the hills uh, east of Los Angeles. And they had horses, they had uh, riding lessons, and it was quite of a full, full score uh, of, of experience for young people. As the city grew, they were confined to just an area of about, oh, I guess you'd say a block square. Uh -huh. And they had buildings there, and they had about 400 students, and uh, four and a half to 14 years of age. Okay. So I got engulfed into that pretty quickly. And so this, this was like, almost like being in the military. Yes, it was. It was very military oriented. They had uh, many West Point dropouts that came to work as supervisors in our school. <laughs> really? I, I was impressed by that. But we had companies and platoons and squads. We had ranks. We had corporal punishment if we misbehaved and um, lots of activities, but not much classroom work. Private school didn't have much interest in we spent time in school, but I don't ever remember reading a book. I don't ever remember learning very much. And what would the corporal punishment consist of? If you misbehaved in the dining room, uh, usually there was an older student wandering around and he would bop you on the head with a tablespoon. Uh -huh. uh, and if you misbehaved with your food, uh, you got sent to a, a table which was uh, where when you went through the line to get your food, all your food and your drink was placed in a single bowl. And you sat at this table and ate with your hands. 
which really cured most of the problems the kids had with their manners. And uh, you said this was called the pigsty. It was called pigsty table. Yeah, I never went there. How oh, good. <laughs> um, but uniforms, you wouldn't wear them all the time. No, just just on parade days and when we went home. And you had to make tight bunks and all that sort of stuff. They sort of, uh, as you got older, you did. When you were younger, they had uh, house mothers that would come by and kind of tidy up the beds and oh, okay. couldn't do it. Now, your mother was um, working there. Yes. And she eventually, oh, oh eventually from Page uh, Military School, you go to Los Angeles High School. Los Angeles High was within a mile of the military school, so okay. I was able to walk there. And would that, I mean, if you had to pick a little, one of the suburban cities that was there then by page, do you, you know what, what area of L.A. you'd be closest to? Was it South Central? Because you said you were by U USC. Um, I think it would probably be sort of in the central area because we weren't far from, um, from the park that has the historic... Uh, archaeologic sites, La Brea Tar Pits. Okay, sure. And so it was right in that area of the city, and I don't quite remember yeah, what that was. That's close pretty much to. close to downtown. Yeah, it is. I remember going to La Brea when I was a little mm -hmm. boy. <laughs> um, so tell us a little bit about Los Angeles High School. Well, it was 4,500 students, and uh, it was pretty well organized. It was one of the big feeders to UCLA and uh, USC, I'm sure, uh, heavily emphasized artistic activities, including acting, performing, because there were scouts from most of the big studios in Los Angeles that would come and, and look at the actors and actresses and see if they felt they were suitable for working in the movies. Um, it wasn't a terribly friendly school. It was pretty cliquish. Of course, I was from a school that had nine graduates. Yeah. Now, Page Military didn't have very many. And so I was one of two at uh, LA High from this particular feeder school, Page. Uh -huh. And as such, I didn't know very many people. Uh, I was in the ROTC, though. And so that was my big ac extracurricular activity. Um, my last year, which was my junior year, I wanted to join one of the clubs and uh, you had to go through a review board to join a club to find out how active you were, what things you did. I said I went to all the football games and I would attend to all of the activities that uh, the ROTC did. That wasn't good enough. So I didn't get accepted into the Usher Club, which was considered one of the, the easier clubs to get into. So I really didn't have a very positive feeling about the social environment. I don't blame you. Um, and then at some point, I guess close to the end of your junior year, your mother accepted another job. In Fresno. Right. And so, and I didn't want to go to Fresno. I, I knew about Fresno. And uh, I just had driven through there when I was driving cars from Sacramento to Los Angeles because my father was a uh, regional manager of a repossession company called A.J. Walker. And uh, I'd been through those towns, uh, Bakersfield, Fresno, and I thought, you know, maybe I'll go and stay a couple years with my dad. He's in Sacramento, he's got three, four kids now, and I'll finish my high school up there. So I did, and went to El Camino High, was in their second graduating class, and liked it very much. I went into four or five clubs at the beginning, and said, gee, what do I have to do to join? Show up. <laughs> that was El Camino. Show up. Yeah. So I uh, was very active in some ways, but uh, actually I worked a lot. I had a lot of jobs and did things. I always had a car because my dad was in the auto business. Yeah. My first was a 1929 Model A Ford with a rumble seat. <laughs> wow. Now that, I that was never classic. knew anyone who had, knew, yeah. had a Model A. And was I popular. <laughs> yeah. Now, uh, you mentioned some of the jobs you did, and I was interested in that because I worked as a bagger at Mayfair Market 
uh, at one time. What stores were you working for? Well, I worked for two grocery stores, and I was a box boy, yeah. or a bagger, and the second one I was the head box boy, and that was on the corner of, I think, uh, El Camino and Arden. Okay. It seemed like that's where it was. And the first one that I worked at was in the center, right at the end of Arden Way and Watt Avenue. It's no longer there now. It's right. a bunch of other stores. Sure. But that's the first store I worked at. I also worked at Doris Lumber and Molding mm -hmm. because uh, the Hamilton family lived right across the street from where my dad was living, and I knew him, and so he got, helped me get a job there. I worked the night shift as a cleanup boy and uh, air brushing off all of the machines. So that was kind of interesting. I also worked. Uh, as I said, I worked for my dad, looking at cars in uh, various lots that had been repossessed, and the bank wanted the numbers of the cars. And so I did that. Uh, let's see what else I worked at. Oh, I worked in, in landscaping. A fellow called One Shrub Anderson, we used to nickname, because he didn't have very big jobs, but worked at that for a summer. Then I worked for a construction company uh, for a summer. And uh, that was pretty hard work. So I kept busy all the time. And uh, when I was at the following the high school, I went to a junior college, Sacramento City College, uh -huh. and uh, continued to work at various jobs while I was there. You know, it's interesting you mentioned Doris Lumber because if you're heading out Highway 50 today, you'll see a big water tower uh, on the right, just past uh, what 65th Street. Right. And it says Doris on it. Right. And uh, John Hamilton, who lived next door to you, was one of my friends in high school. We, were, we graduated the same year. Really? And I was passing through, uh, heading north uh, towards Idaho, driving by myself a couple of years ago. And here's a little town of Doris. Here's the Doris Lumber Company and everything. And it turns out his, his mother's family were the Doris uh, mm. family. And so. I called John at that time and said, guess, guess where I am? But um, I think they pretty much sold everything out here now, I'm not sure. But they still do have some molding yeah. there, and, uh, but I don't think they have the company there. They had a dozen big machines, molding machines, and yeah. maybe quite a racket. They have a huge place up in Doris, you know, which is just about the whole town. That's about it. Um, okay, then next you're going to graduate from... Sac City College, and you're going to go to UC Davis. Right. And I was in my junior year, and I completed those two years there uh, and applied to UC San Francisco, uh, which is quite a process, and went down for interviews, and they asked me, why do you want to come to UC San Francisco? I said, because it's the city of my birth. And yeah. they thought that was a pretty good answer. So. Uh, then spent four years in the medical school there. Okay. When did you meet your wife? Actually, I met my wife as a freshman in junior college. Oh, okay. Uh, she was a sophomore at La Sierra High School. Okay. And uh, my dad and his wife uh, went to Carmichael Community Presbyterian Church. Uh -huh. And uh, I hadn't had too much church activity, but I really liked that uh, Presbyterian Church and became pretty active in it and I met her on a snow retreat that we had, uh, the church retreat, and from that point on we were almost uh, always together. Now she would have graduated from La Sierra one right here, do you know? Well, it was two years after I graduated. Uh, okay. She was a freshman at UC Davis when I was a senior. Uh, I'm just curious because I had a lot of friends at La Sierra right. and, uh, who might know her. Um, so how was medical school? It was thrilling. It was probably the most exciting educational exposure I'd ever had. We had superb professors, um, lots of clinical experience, and worked very hard. But I also worked, I was the uh, house manager for Phi Chi Medical Fraternity for two years, and then I became an extern at um, 
St. Mary's, which uh, is a big hospital not very far away from Parnassus, and which is right next to the uh, the park there, is, does it Golden Gate Park. Does it still exist, St. Mary's? Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. It was the busiest hospital at the time I was an extern, which means that I would go in at night and do histories and physicals for the patients who were coming in for surgery because the doctors didn't really want to do that. So right. they had medical students who would get paid $5 a case, and uh, it took me about an hour to do a good history and physical, and type it up, dictate it up, and then they would pass their state exams by having histories and physicals on all their patients. I did that my junior and senior year, um, and uh, then following graduation, I came to Sacramento County Hospital because it was one of the better county hospitals in the state. And they also had a program there for family practice residents. And I joined that and completed my three years training there. And that's what is UC Davis Hospital today. Yes. My, my right. Last year, uh, the city sold the campus for $1.00 to UC Davis, uh -huh. and uh, they brought in a, uh, some fellows from Michigan to run the new UC Davis Medical School, and uh, I showed them around the campus. Oh, nice. But at some point here, you get a draft notice. Actually, everybody who was graduated at that time got a draft notice. I extended my residency training by two more years through a program called the Barry Program. Senator Barry wrote a program where if you join the service voluntarily without being drafted, they would allow you to complete your residency uh, without being drafted. Well, it was going to happen either way, so I said, why not get my training out of the way first, which I did, and then immediately got drafted. And once you get drafted, you're sent to medical field service training? Medical field service training in um, uh, Sam Houston, Fort Sam Houston, there were 650 doctors and dentists that went through my class, the largest medical field service training class they'd had, because that was the height of the Vietnam conflict. And um, it wasn't very difficult, because I'd been to mil military school, I'd been to ROTC, and it was mostly the kind of minutia that the military wants their officers to have. Mm -hmm. So this, that program was how long? Six weeks. Okay. And then right from there, do you go to Vietnam? Um, as soon as I drove my family, I had an eight-week-old son, and my wife and I drove back to Sacramento, and within three days, I was in Oakland. Uh, that was the Army base then. Right. But taken to Oakland and then driven back to Travis Air Force Base to fly out. And um, so did you pick? Vietnam? No, you get your, in your draft notice, you get your assignment. And I didn't understand it, so I talked to somebody who was in the military and he says, you're going to Nam. <laughs> so, <laughs> so he helped me figure out the chicken scratch. But you had this, this good attitude, you figured, this is where I'll get a lot of exposure to medical work, I mean. Well, I sort of assumed that I would do a lot of things medically there. Uh, I certainly felt well trained having gone to the county hospital where I did an awful lot of trauma work. And, uh, but you never know. You didn't know whether you were going to get assigned a desk job or what. Well, you certainly didn't get a desk job. Tell us about that. Well, when I landed in, uh, in Vietnam, it was late in the evening, and so we got sent right to our barracks. And the next morning, uh, we were called out, one or two at a time, into an office, and I can't remember the title of the person there, but he sat you down and says, oh, you're Dr. So-and-so, and this is where you're going. So I was assigned to the 1st Infantry Division, Big Red 1, 2nd of the 16th Battalion, uh, which is a Ranger Battalion, and I would be leaving that morning by helicopter and be there by midday. I had friends who served in that battalion. Did you? <laughs> yes. Um, so, what was your, you were there nine months, what was your work, I mean, what, what sort of thing did you do? Well, most physicians were usually, uh, usually assigned a six-month rotation through uh -huh. the field. 
First, the infantry division. First infantry division was the only infantry division that kept their doctors with the troops all the time. All the other divisions seemed to fly them out on a daily basis or as needed. But the first infantry was customary that the doctor and the chaplain would bunk together and they'd be in the field 100%. So of the nine months I was in the field, I spent two nights back in base camp, which was outside of Saigon. Wow. So were you doing a lot of surgery or? Mostly I ran the battalion aid station. Uh, I had medics in each of the companies, each of the platoons actually, and then the, the wherever the headquarters company was, <clears throat> we had a, a battalion aid station which was always uh, dug out, so we had two or three bags, sandbags overhead in case we received uh, any incoming. And then we would take care of pretty much whatever happened. Uh, and serious wounds, I would say 75% of them were flown out immediately from where they were. Helicopters would come in, medevacs would take them out. About 20 to 25% of the wounded, I would see, they'd fly me out to where they were or get me there somehow. <clears throat> so, you received a silver star. And don't be modest, like you talked to me before, I want to know what occurred then? Because doctors typically don't get solar stars. <laughs> well, I did see a fair amount of action with the troops, and uh, <clears throat> we would get mortared uh, by the enemy somewhere after, usually around dinner time, and or shortly thereafter. And most of the time, there was no problem. This particular night, we were in our command staff group which happened every evening, and we'd sit around and discuss what was going on from each of the departments, and I would give a report on the health of the battalion uh, from the number of sick people, athletes' foot, or various other things. And it was towards the end of that meeting that I heard the mortars start coming in. And there, next to the command staff tent was a bunker where they had all the the radio equipment and various things. Well, everybody took out from the command staff and went down into the bunker. And I was sort of sitting at one side and I saw the lineup and I said, yeah, I'm not gonna make it. So anyway, I just ducked down next to the sandbags and huddled there until I hear up the motors, mortars go over. And usually they went in a, a, a linear event. They moved the mortar tube and see what they could get. So after it passed me, I immediately got up and ran to the aid station because I knew there could be and there were wounded. And uh, some of the mortars apparently hit a couple of our, our bunkers uh, where they were fighting bunkers, uh, which had sandbags over them and they were dug down with fighting holes, they called them. Uh, General Hay was named the fighting hole. And several injured men that I helped remove from the sandbag filled holes and got them over to the aid station and essentially dressed their wounds and some of them had chest wounds and other wounds uh, but the medics and I got them settle, settled in and stable for air evacuation and uh, I didn't pay attention but they told me there was shells going on around and there were bullets flying around and when you're in the middle of something like that, all you're thinking about is your wounded men and get them better, get them out. So uh, it was about three months later that I got a notice from someone that I had been, I was going to receive an award. And they flew me back to Saigon and that's when the uh, medical commander for the for the Far East came and, and presented me with the Silver Star. Well, that's very commendable, Ron. Something to be really proud of. So you were in the field for nine months. Nine months. Three months longer than most folks had to. Right. And then for your last three months? I was a clearing company commander in a little community called Quan Loi, which was on Highway 13 coming down from Cambodia. And it was one of the main routes where uh, the North would send things to the South. 
and they also had an airfield there, and they had a medevac uh, station there, and clearing companies are usually the first place that wounded men are taken after they're in the field, and then they're stabilized there and then sent to the evac hospitals. Well, Vietnam's evacuation system was so efficient that most the uh, wounded would go directly to an evac hospital and they wouldn't go to the clearing company. But some did, and so we were always uh, prepared to take care of what we could. Mm -hmm. So once you finished your year in Vietnam, you still had some time to serve the Army. Yes, I did. I had another year. Okay. And where did you do and that? I did that at Aberdeen Proving Ground in Maryland, which is on the headwaters of the Chesapeake Bay. I spent uh, part of the year at Kirk Army Hospital, which is the Army Hospital there, and then part of the year at Edgewood Arsenal, which is about 10 miles away, uh, which is the nerve gas center at that time of the military. And you said uh, you felt your, this was a good thing for you because you wanted to see how East Coast medicine was. Right. There. I had been raised and educated on the West Coast, and uh, I figured that going in the East Coast I could get a feel for how they dealt with the same kind of problems we had. Although it was a military, so it wasn't really East Coast medicine, it was yeah. military medicine. Sure. But did, we got to see the East Coast. Did you see a difference? Uh, from the military standpoint, I did not, but yeah. I did see uh, quite a difference in the s students and in the residents that would come west from the east, uh -huh. uh, a variety of different backgrounds and training. But I really wanted to see the east coast visit Washington, D.C., and New York, and um, many of the places that were beautiful back there. Yeah, nice. So, once you got out of the Army, you went to Vacaville? I arranged for a practice in Vacaville. One of my classmates in medical school resided in Vacaville Fairfield, and he said, why don't you come practice here? Well, I, my wife's family was in Sacramento, and my mother was in Oakland, so I said, well, that's kind of nice, right in the between. And so I, I made arrangements to have a, an office built by a local pharmacist who was building things. And I outfitted it from Sears and uh, with some medical equipment and went right into practices. In, it was uh, August 1st, 1969. So this is a family practice? Family practice. Okay. And you did that for several years. Uh, how about 25? Yeah. And then you had a second job in, in Vacaville. I also, well, I did a lot of things in Vacaville. I was the, uh, uh, the health officer for the city. Uh, I was the team physician for Vacaville High School for about 15 years. And um, following my 25-year career, I and my group joined a, uh, a larger organization in Fairfield called Fairfield Medical Group, which then joined Sutter Health. And uh, I went with them and then became the medical director for the Sutter Health system in the Vacaville Fairfield area. And so you were the director for about 70 physicians? Yes. Towards the end, we had about 70 physicians. And you finally retired in... 1973? Uh, six years ago. Oh. Next month. Okay. Yeah, this is 73. I'm way off here. Um, and so then now you're retired. What do you do with your time? Well, I don't have any free time. Uh, <laughs> I'm a woodworker and I have two grandchildren. We had two sons, and the youngest is in Vacaville with his two children, and my oldest uh, son is in. Sausalito, and so we spend some time with them. I do quite a bit of woodworking. Uh, I'm the uh, chairman of the Building and Grounds Committee at Davis Community Church, and uh, my wife's very active in things, so we're always busy. Well, that's an interesting career, I have to admit. Ron, I'd, I'd like to just thank you for being here today. It's an honor to have you. My pleasure. And it's a wonderful story, and I'm glad we heard it. Thank you very much. Thank you.
That concludes this episode of Valley to Vietnam. We'll be with you next time with a new episode. Thank you.